Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another Academic Innovation Support interview. Uh, as always, I'm Noah Shartoff, joined by my colleague, John McNally. We have backgrounds in education, myself in mathematics and John in physics. And today we have a guest I'm very excited about, and I will let him introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noah. John, thanks for having me. I mean, I've been an avid watcher of everything that comes uh, at least on the YouTube channel. Um, We're very happy to hear that. Particularly also love how a CEO can live stream uh, all those conversations. I think that's fantastic. Yes, my name is Jay. Uh, my full name is Jean, Jean actually, but uh, I would always joke that my parents couldn't spell. <laughs> they wanted the uh, French pronunciation and they spelled it the Spanish way. Uh, I have no Spanish connections, but, uh, you know, throughout the decades have had to suffer the consequences of the uh, of the prowess when it comes to spelling. <laughs> anyway, uh, most people call me J. That's fine. I respond to anything that starts vaguely with a J. And uh, my background, uh, once again, thanks for having me. It's fantastic. I think uh, for me, it's always uh, good for me to talk about these things, to talk about the Wolfram language specifically. Uh, my background, though, is uh, as uh, uh, I'm a surgeon. I trained to be a surgeon. I went to uh, medical school many, many years ago. Uh, went directly uh, to uh, to do my residency in surgery. Maybe someone can hear from my accent where I'm really from at the moment. Uh, I've been I'm way way up there, right in that little corner there in Washington D.C. Um, but as I say, maybe someone in the audience can know from my accent where I'm from. Uh, studied to become a surgeon, did my residency, and eventually ended up being uh, being the head of the acute care surgery unit at, uh, I'll now say where I'm from, that was at Grudeskir Hospital. Um, there's always one little pride that we have uh, always had at Grudeskir Hospital, of course, the home of the uh, first human heart transplant with Christian wow. Barnard. So a fantastic place uh, that I ended up in and a fantastic place to, to be a surgeon. And I was a surgeon there for, for quite some time, establishing that acute care surgery unit. Um, and uh, then the pandemic struck, of course. I think uh, um, though we're talking Wolfram language, I was also a keynote speaker at uh, two years ago at JupyterCon and actually uh, did that, uh, you know, we couldn't get together. So, uh, you know, there was a conference, everyone was at home and I actually gave that talk uh, from uh, the operating room um, and um, had to unfortunately, you know, just share the, the horrible news of the loss of some colleagues, you know, the day before. And that was truly a horrible time. Mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as a, you know, as a surgeon, what, we, what had happened to us, we had closed most of our operating theaters and we would only operate the, the dire emergencies. And I remember very specifically Sorry to delve on a, you know, in a pandemic that we all trying no, to please. Forget. But remembering uh, the 20th, 25th of December, Christmas Day, uh, walking into the hospital and, and there was one, one single non-COVID case in, in the whole hospital that, was, that I was covering that day. And that was a patient that I had done some emergency surgery on the day before. And the rest was this COVID. And, uh, you know, we all downed our tools. Uh, I particularly downed my tools as far as my teaching the academia and, and research was concerned, you know, just to, to help out where we can. So that was a particularly difficult time. Um, but before that, um, I had slowly transitioned into uh, doing much more research and the support, uh, perhaps more so than anything else, of the research efforts. Before the pandemic. Hit. Before the pandemic. And um, as it slowed down, um, you know, got the call from this side of the uh, of the Atlantic, and um, you know, was recruited by by the George Washington University, where I've been now for the last uh, for the last year in the School of Public Health, and just trying to expand on what I had started uh, prior to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, but it certainly has been a very interesting, a very very interesting time, um, a very sad time, very difficult time, of course, for for service delivery. Um, as far as, as health is concerned. And, and I think from there also, perhaps opening my eyes wider from just the world of providing care to one human being at a time, which is what you can do as a surgeon, mm -hmm. uh, is help one human being at a time. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a glacial pace of trying to help society one person at a time, um, you know, the, the, and, and then the involvement with, with research just to, uh, to move then uh, full time into the public health space and the education of public health and research in public health. 
together with that, obviously still having the connections um, back, uh, large research uh, units that we are now building, which is, uh, let's be honest about it, easier to build from here. There's many more resources here than in a resource constrained environment. And so uh, establishing now, you know, some large uh, research groups um, with, with trying to solve some of the big issues in, in the under-resourced uh, environments, you know, that we do have around the world. So yes, that is totally different worlds. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm chattering away now, but perhaps the last thing I should say, what, what got me involved in this is that uh, I think medicine was always my parents, uh, back to them again. Ah. Uh, thank you. You know, they dream. Uh, I, I was fully sold on it, of course. I mean, I would not have done so many years uh, of, of study and work not to do it. My first love, though, was always uh, some bent towards mathematics. And uh, after becoming a surgeon, I, I did the, the typical, uh, what it seems like, CEO of a big company, maybe Apple, etc., and just go take all the mathematics courses that you want, because I can just walk across campus when I have some time. So I studied mathematics after that. And and the world of mathematics and, and, and of course, surgery colliding would, would, of course, end up being biostatistics. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, that's, that's how the world came, the worlds came together. There's another interesting part about how the Medical Council in South Africa changed the rules as far as registering as a specialist concerned, and perhaps later we can get to that, which really set me on the path of trying to educate um, people involved in healthcare, as far as as using statistics and in the broader sense today, data science is concerned. Before we get into the more uh, educational aspects, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on some of the ways that you use data in order to make discoveries about ways to uh, help serve these under-resourced areas that you were describing. Yes, yes, that's an unsolved problem, of course, and I think there's a lot more that has to go in this. Uh, a lot of the research money in the world would necessarily go towards, uh, you know, diseases and disease complexes uh, sure. that afflict, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the better resourced areas in the world. And I think um, coming from a resource constrained environment where, um, you know, we punch above our weight, um, but still struggle immensely, I think it would be very rare to find someone, you, you know, who, who's in full time academic clinical practice, um, doing all these other things as well. And as, as part and parcel of the fact that, that that we do have those resource constraints. So what it is about for me is that there are so many unsolved healthcare problems. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you empower people to solve their own problem, you know, to wait for someone else to give you money to wait, uh, you know, to have a more colonialist approach to that, you know, there's all sorts of problems with that. And, and, and when you encourage people when you light that fire, and show them, you know, how to how to do their own research because they are they understand their problem way better than anyone else. Uh -huh. And if you light that fire, and perhaps now would be a good opportunity to talk about the fact that a couple of years ago, the health the, the medical council in South Africa changed the rules as far as being able to to register as a specialist. No longer do you have to do only your residency and and your in your exams, but you also have to produce a research project. Uh -huh. Mm. Yeah, that was an enormously, you know, that was... The, and this is to be a surgeon. Opinion. Yeah, no, to any kind, any specialist, any medical uh -huh. specialist. And that was a very good decision. The only problem with the decision, of course, is that there was no resources available to help. Say, for instance, at the University of Cape Town, uh, there's more than 500 people doing their residency you know, in medicine, gynecology, surgery, orthopedics, you know, you name it. There's more than five. And to put in the resources to help 500 people with their research projects, and, and these are clinicians that know nothing about statistics, that most of them, they know, you know very little about it, put those resources into place. It was an enormous undertaking without any money and support. And I, that was my, I think, the birth initially of me, you know, just starting to help people. People know now that I can help people start knocking on your door. Uh -huh. And and from there, this, you know that, that you suddenly see how many people you can help and what they start producing after that you know if you look a year two years down the line now they've got three four papers out they know what to do uh, you know you, you've empowered them and, and and i think there's so much that can be done in, in that sense uh, that you don't need um you don't need much to you know, if you have an enthusiastic person you know with 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 intelligence which you know all of this all of our students have uh -huh. It, it, it was such a pleasure to light all those fires and and what empowered me to light all those fires of course was was the wolfram language you know that was my main use case of the wolfram language at the time 
outside of you know just enjoying its use in, in, in just pursuing new knowledge in mathematics. That, that of course makes us happy to hear. So uh, when now, I mean, you've produced uh, course materials and courses and, and many, many things that are educational resources. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what were the early experiments that you had in this area after you saw this, this uh, need for helping people to be able to, uh, you know, solve their own problems using the tools of mathematics and statistics? So what, what were the early, uh, you know, experiments and projects that, that you did in, in terms mm -hmm. of helping people discover these superpowers? Well, I mean, it was purely needs driven in the beginning, in as much as here's someone who, you know, has done their residency, they want to register as a specialist, and the medical council says, no, you know, where is your research project? Or, you know, where, where is your paper? Mm -hmm. and suddenly, you, you have this massive uh, amount of pressure from people who really need to get out and do their service delivery as a specialist, you know, to register with a council, and, and they just, you know, it's impossible for them to do so. Now, I'm talking a specific case in a specific country, but remember, by that time, through other means, um, what we had done, for instance, through the College of Surgeons, we reached out to many institutions throughout West and East Africa, trying to establish, res establish residencies in their own countries. So by that time, I had done an enormous amount of work of you know, working with surgeons there to establish how do you how do you set up exams, you know, for people who want to do residency in your own country? How do you set that up? And we had you know done that help some using South Africa as a specific use case, but this extended well beyond South Africa by that time. Um, so yeah, solving a, a real world problem. Here's someone who wants to to register and they're struggling. They don't understand. You know, they 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 never took mathematics as a medical school. <laughs> Um, Sydney was not interested in mathematics and had no time to study mathematics or biostatistics by, while being a resident. You know, the, the, the workload, uh, you know, depending on where in the world you do your residency is enormous. And, and of course, in South Africa, many people visit South Africa um, to do a, you know, to do a rotation there because the workload as far as, as healthcare is concerned is just enormous. So if you, if you want to learn how to operate on someone's abdomen, uh, from a gunshot wound, unfortunately, you, you know, you, you go to South Africa, that's where you'll, you, you know, you'll get your experience. Um, so there's no time for these people. And so how do you onboard them in a short amount of time, you know, with enormous amount of other stress, stresses in their life, enormous workload in their life, how do you onboard them quickly to understand the data that they're dealing with, uh, how to analyze it, how to view it? Um, luckily, you know, it's, fortunately, some of them you catch beforehand. So you can say, well, let's set up your research project before you collect any data. Don't come to me and now your data is already collected. That's just a, a nightmare. Usually, and most people, you know, work with data would know that, that that's where you spend your time cleaning up data. Yeah. And so how do you onboard someone under those sort of circumstances? And how do you, how do you, um, uh, you know, grow that? You, you know, you're one person trying to achieve this m most of the time. Uh, you know, so how do you replicate all of this? And, and um, you know, there's languages that make this easy, and and I would count uh, the Wolfram language uh, amongst that. And and, and uh, I'll tell you straight off the bat, my favorite function of all time. I mean, a language with over over six thousand functions or keywords is, is an enormous language. But there's one function that stands uh, head and shoulders above the the rest. And uh, whoever came up with that one, please send them my. Uh, Personal thank you, and that's the manipulate function. Oh time. yes, yeah. <laughs> we're we're <laughs> quite a fan of that one as well. should have a, a manipulate function. You know, how easy to set up and and show someone live how something changes depending on your input. You know the use cases of the of the manipulate function are enormous. Yes, but just that ability, and maybe later I'll show in a book a little bit about that. But how easy it is just to 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 see to show someone this is what happens. This is what happens to your data. This, if you change something, this is what happens. And of course, it, it extends beyond just biostatistics and research. Well, but sure, absolutely. Onboard, the onboarding any sort of, oh, sorry. Say, say, say again, no? We're just saying that I agree with you completely. In almost every sort of quantitative system, the most interesting question you could be asking is not what things are, but how they could change. Mm -hmm. No, ab absolutely. So hats off, hats off to, to whoever invented the manipulate or added the manipulate function to, to the Wolfram language. Um, you know, you wrap anything inside that function and, and the educational uh, opportunity that comes from that's just enormous. So yes, for me, the Wolfram language, and, and, and I will mention, I mean, I don't think one should only use one language. Uh, you know, if you can oh, speak, sure. if you're polyglot, the normal spoken language is such a, 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 a good thing. And, and same with other languages. So yes, you know, there, was, there were use cases for Python, there's use cases for R. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically the way I work now in public health, you, you know, we sit in DC, uh, we're very closely connected to the federal government, 
um, you know, the FDA institutions like that, you know, there's certain expectations as far as language is concerned in these mm -hmm. instances. So yes, other languages, you know, are used and, 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 and I certainly use them. But uh, as far as my experience, just that rapid onboarding um, was, was uh, so much easier in the Wolfram language, came easier with the Wolfram language. And by that time, I was well versed with the Wolfram language. Now, let me preface this by saying a small subset of the Wolfram language. Well, sure. Which, which, by the way, if you think about it, uh, you need to know so little about the, the Wolfram language to do so much. So forgive me for being a salesperson as far as the Wolfram <laughs> language is. But let's be honest about this. Uh, you look at that documentation page and you see all the nice colors of all the different areas that are covered. You know, is there anything in, 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 you know, that you can think about computationally that's not you know, on that page? But you need very little actually to do a lot. And, and I think for me, that was, uh, I, I could see that, you know, I felt that I lived that, that with so little use of that language, I could really help, uh, help a lot of people uh, very quickly. We actually have a follow-up question from the audience. So you, you mentioned uh, rapid onboarding of people. So the audience is curious if you could say a little bit more about your own onboarding. Like how did you initially come across the Wolfram language and start using it yourself? That's, I, 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 for the life of me, I can't tell you when the first time I wrote the line of Wolfram code was concerned. I, uh, um, what I do remember is walking in into a bookshop and seeing just a book and it said Mathematica on the side. Mm -hmm. Now, I think by that time I had heard of Mathematica. That was not the first time I'd ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I, uh, you know, when we moved across to the US, one of the things I had to leave behind temporarily was all my books because, you know, books are heavy. <laughs> you know, to bring them across is, is an enormous expense. It's much easier just to rebuy them. Now, my wife uh, will, uh, you know, she says no more, no more books. But anyway, <laughs> I do remember buying a book. <laughs> And um, starting to page through it and then immediately have to get the software. And I think that was my first real, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting my hands dirty now. Um, that's what I seem to remember. Had I coded a little bit before, I think I might have used at the university, uh, you know, some other time had some done. But that's my vivid, you know, the memory of at, at least now doing it seriously. Let, okay. I I... The book that I randomly saw in a, in a bookshop. I, I had a, a similar question. You mentioned that mathematics was your first love. Do you remember what got you into mathematics? Because I've I found a lot of people who describe math as an early love of theirs have very different answers to that question. Yes, I, I, I think some of it is, um, um, you know, do you like, uh, you know, I can state this probably in a couple of ways. Do you like Fanta? Do you like Coca-Cola? Or maybe I mm -hmm. should say, you like Merlot or Cabernet Sauvignon, you know what, you know, um, so the, I think there's a natural, you, you, you discover all these things at school when you're at your most curious, you know, when you're at your most, um, almost, let's say vulnerable in a positive sense, vulnerable yeah. to this new world that you see around you. Say and, most absorbent, perhaps. Yes, let's put it that way. I, I, I want to use all of, all of the terms in the most positive sense here. And so you see things and they speak to you, don't they? So they, yeah. there's absolutely this natural, um, um, it's going to speak to you. Let's, let's, let's leave it at that. And then though, I think the fortunate part is having a good teacher. Mm -hmm. I remember um, her as being the most enthusiastic. And, and by that, I mean, not, not, not um, you know, grade one or grade two, I mean, middle school, high school. Um, you know, all the systems in the world are all different. So let's just stick to high school. I, my high school teacher mathematics being the most interesting, phenomenal a person as far as, again, lighting that fire uh, of the love of math mathematics and making it so enjoyable, you know, looking forward to that double period. So, you know, two classes in a row, uh, you know, I don't know where in the world that, that uh, things work like that, but <laughs> those uh, two periods in a row of mathematics is looking forward to that just so absolutely much and just absorbing everything. Um, um, so yes, I think that innate, well, this is what I like and I don't like that. You know, there's lots of things in school I didn't like. I did not like history. I did not like uh, many other things, um, but physics, mathematics, uh, specifically mathematics, um, innate enjoyment of it, finding it interesting, and then just, just by pure luck, having a person who shows that to you right in the beginning, mm -hmm. are absorbent, let's put it that way, then um, <laughs> um, being lucky enough, being fortunate enough to have a person like that, and who really encouraged every single student in that class. I remember, you know, I remember the effort that she had gone through. 
And if it wasn't for her, maybe my experience would have been different. But, um, you know, I would have purely had to rely on me just loving the subject. Um, but yeah, I think everyone needs a teacher, you know, uh, such as that. Yeah, so speaking of this, so you, you've mentioned that manipulate is one way for people to explore. So uh, when you're taking students who are uh, entering this world of biostatistics, how do you uh, help them have this sense of, of exploration and enthusiasm when they're onboarding into learning really any language, but uh, you mentioned one, one tool. So what are the sorts of techniques that you use as an educator so that students can have the same attitude and, and enjoy, you know, they're getting into this, this area that they really need in terms of being able to solve their research problems? It really depends, you know, on your setting. If, if it was a resident, you know, who just has to get this project done with a very finite amount of time, I, I'm not going to produce someone who understands biostatistics at, at any kind of depth. You know, I, what I wanted from them is the ability to read a paper critically, mm -hmm. look at the section, to understand, you know, when it says this is the p-value, what that really means, what context you put in, where does it come from? You know, mm -hmm. the first time that any of us saw a p-value in a journal uh, article, and if you had by that time no mathematics background, it's a very mysterious thing, you know, <laughs> and you, uh, you, you uh, blindly believe because this value is very small that this must make sense and everyone tells you that this is important now and, you know, you just go with the flow. Um, until you understand what it really means and and um, so that's a bit more difficult if you have a constrained uh, period of time what you really want there is for someone to appreciate what it means what the constraints are um, you know how you know in the easiest possible way how to understand that and what you want from them is just to enrich their uh, experience of reading a paper and being critical about that paper so that mm -hmm. is something that you can pick up in medical school of course in residency because we have journal clubs you're going to discuss those so you naturally pick that up but just with a little bit of background uh, your understanding of, of what those results mean is, 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 is so much better. And for you to inform your practice, you know, to change your practice based on a paper, you really have to look at it critically. Uh -huh. And you usually, you know, you cannot see that decision um, to some uh, to some other authority. Um, you must make that decision for yourself. Of, of course, you go to a conference and everyone says, this is now the way we're going to do so There's some new guideline that comes out. You are going to follow that guideline. But in some sense, if you want to use the, the literature to inform your practice, you have to have some understanding of that. Now I get into the privileged, privileged position to have a whole semester to teach this, you know, uh -huh. to teach a, a subject. Now, there's no way that you can actually do this all in 15 weeks. You know, you need a lot longer and, and the students also have many other courses. So, yeah, your constraints are still there. But now you have a different, you know, you, you have a different opportunity. You can really build something up from the ground. Uh -huh. And to me, education um uh, in-person education is and perhaps no one else will agree with me but i will not be moved from this education is a performance art <laughs> oh yeah absolutely uh, i completely agree with you on that as well yeah okay so at least we there are an awful lot of people who either don't seem to think so or if uh, they do think so put very little effort into that aspect of it but it no. absolutely is one no, it is it is a performance art it is that you know, I've done so much work and I've had so much success in the online education space. Um, and, and you know, we, we can talk about that as well. But to me, still, unfortunately, I'm going to lean towards, you know, the in-person because there's something, <laughs> there's something that I can bring to the table. There's some aspect of my personality. Um, maybe it's, you know, because I was a surgeon. I don't know. There's something in me that can come out that I feel that connects. And uh, it, of course, it is that eye contact. Of course, it's those subtle cues of body movement, and you know, from the student side, that you can see the frown on the face, the the lifting of the eyebrows. You know, you, that's such a pleasurable experience going through that, and um, the uh, eureka moments or the understand moments. I think you had mentioned that in one of your previous talks that that, that I had watched here on the channel. Um, you know, there's there's something to be said about that and that performance art, and also. As I mentioned, my mathematics uh, teacher, you know, bringing out that love and excitement and enjoyment to say yes. that you hate, you might hate statistics, but let me show you the beauty of it. Let me show you the beauty of what a human mind came up with. This, what is this construct called the scientific method? Let's explore this and see the beauty, the power uh, that lies in that. You know, and and if I think if you bring out that enthusiasm and and, mm -hmm. you, and, and you bring people in, and now you have these wonderful tools available to you to bring it alive in front of someone as opposed to maybe a dry textbook uh not the textbooks are bad i'm you know right sure <laughs> well yeah so i, I was I actually i mean that there are bad textbooks there are bad yes. everything yes. but yes 
Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was hoping you could elaborate on th this question of uh, online education and textbooks, right? Because yeah. you've been very, very successful in, in both the online education sphere and in, you know, writing textbooks. Nevertheless, you have an attitude I agree with that there, there's something about the in-person interaction, which, which adds an extra little something. So um, the, the question is, you know, what are the sorts of things that, that you find uh, do translate well from the in-person space to these other spaces, be they text or, or online? And, and then what are the... the things that, that you keep in mind when you're designing for this not, you know, synchronous in-person space. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to just once again say how fortunate I've been in life uh, um, as far as that aspect is concerned. And if I do forget, please remind me and ask me about uh, the wonderful work that is done by uh, a division called SILT, the Center for Innovation, Learning and Technology at the University of Cape Town. You know, when MOOCs came, first came out, there's a, a very nice backstory that I have there and the phenomenal work that those people did and the support they gave me specifically. And the help of, of educational specialists you okay. know, to onboard me on in, into this online world. The success is not mine, you know, even though the success has been has been, certainly been there and the rewards and, and recognition has been there. But if it wasn't for for these people, you know, helping me, it certainly would never have been what it is. So my first take on this Move is not, for someone who's not familiar being massive online open courses, massive online open courses. Coursera, the old edX now, you know, of course, uh, bought by to you. Uh, future learn in, in the in the UK, etc. Yeah, and um, so my first my my first thought about this is not what translates best, what works, and what doesn't work. My first thought goes towards. Unfortunately, not everyone can meet me at nine thirty five in lecture room four hundred A. And some people don't want to meet me in lecture room four hundred A at nine thirty five in the morning because being in a class environment is not the best way to teach every single human being. Mm -hmm. I might love that. I might enjoy that in, that engagement. Um, and I'm hoping my students do too. Um, let's say that they do. Um, but there is this, that does not work for everyone. And of mm -hmm. course, um, it's not everyone has is able to do that. And for me, online education solves those two problems. Those that do not want to be there and those that cannot be there. I mean, just a few years ago, education for me was something that was locked up in a high castle, you know, surrounded by walls. And if you could not get there or pay enough money that was inaccessible to you, how fundamentally has the world changed? We can almost not remember how it was, you know, before knowledge was everywhere, the ability mm -hmm. to do something new was everywhere. We seem to not remember that this was not so. When I was younger, I mean, what, what did I have? My parents bought some encyclopedias and, and that, that before the internet, that was my sole and only, you know, connection to knowledge. And I ate those things up, you know, I read those things from <laughs> cover to cover. And, you know, when they bought more, that's what I did. And, and how poor was the world then as far as, you know, making knowledge available. So for me on the online education space, I don't want to think about what can be delivered there better. I feel that that is a democratization of uh, spreading knowledge uh, uh, to others. That, that mm -hmm. for me is the, I want to think about along those lines before I think about and can really think about what works in that space and what doesn't work in that space. Because mm -hmm. even the things that doesn't work in that space, it's going to reach someone mm -hmm. uh, with a cell phone. And that's the only technology they have. Africa, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, the cell phones are ubiquitous there. Laptop computers are not. Most people can't afford that. They have lap. You know, and there's some of these companies, the, 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 the cellular telephone companies uh, throughout Africa, for instance, uh, forgive, forgive me again for those use cases, but, you know, that, that make uh, data available at a, a lower rate for people who are using that data for educational purposes. So that, that happens in, in many spaces. Uh, when the pandemic came along, uh, so many of the, the data, the, the communications companies had zero rated um, you know, that kind of data access. So if we put out something from the university that would not count towards any kind of data usage, you know, on the cellular devices. And, you know, so how do you, the, the ability just to democratize or bring education to those that could otherwise not have it, is, is that, that, that is one of the most phenomenal, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most phenomenal advances in human society. And we underestimate totally, I think totally, we see the you know, we, we want to harp on the negatives of social media. We want to harp on the negatives of any kind of new, uh, you know, new technology. And of course, you know, there's parts of society that drive fear as a form of control over people. And let's not go there. 
Um, let's not fear this. Let's see the positive, the, the phenomenal impact that this has had, this ability to teach more people. It's, it's enormous. I, I can't overstate it. For me, what a wonderful time to be alive and, having, and have had the opportunity to experience it. The, the democracy, excuse me, the democratization of education is certainly a very exciting, uh, you know, reason to be uh, into online education and platforms, uh, for example, like Coursera. Uh, are there any other aspects of this that really excite you aside from the democratization aspect? Um, well, I was interested in initially interested in how do you deal with assessment in this space? Mm -hmm. By that time, I think Coursera had, uh, you know, the um, so the, 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 the behind the scenes story of that is when I saw massive open online courses for the first time, I was sold. I thought this was just the greatest thing because I suddenly took a course and I took another one and another one and another. And that's just me. I, I, I need to learn new things all the time. Um, uh, the reason perhaps why it's, it was possible for me to leave surgery behind is, you know, you, you need some intellectual challenge all the time. So yes, I took many courses. Um, and I thought, well, we have to be part of this. Of course, if you look at the universities by that time who had signed up to edX, who had signed up to Coursera, now there's a bar to entry. Uh, for instance, the University of Cape Town is uh, the highest ranked university on the African continent. Uh, I think Times Higher Ed uh, new rankings came out and still about 170 somewhere in the world. So by far the leading uh, university of the African continent. But then you look at the maps uh, of universities on edX and Coursera and Africa, for instance, there's nothing, nothing. A whole continent, you know, with absolutely no contribution to this exciting new field of massive open online education, education, or massive open online courses. That to me was wrong, so mm. wrong. And uh, had knocked on the door of the uh, vice chancellor, you know, which is like a president or provost kind of thing. This is the leader of the universities in, in, in South Africa would be the vice chancellor knocked on his door, banged on his door, had so many meetings, started, you know, inviting more people to these meetings. I was really the, the, the fly in the ointment there. I wouldn't, you know, the picky <laughs> ball. I, I really pushed uh, and, and fortunately had, had people at that time that joined uh, sort of that push. And he was very generous at that time to, um, you know, to take some of the vice chancellor's fund and to the tune of a couple of million rand, you know, with the rand dollar exchange rate not being that great, it's not as much as you think it was, but make that money available for us to sign up as a university to Coursera. So we had meetings with Coursera, with edX, with Future Learn, and, um, you know, cost was really an issue for us. And we ended up with, with Coursera. And then um, we had put out a call for people to develop courses, of course, for Coursera. And I, I put in my own personal proposal, which was accepted. And then my course on biostatistics was then the first course from an African university on, 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 on Coursera. So, and from that led, you know, led to, to, to many other things. By that time though, I'm at a tangent as I usually do. At that time, you know, the, was how do we solve this problem of assessment? And Coursera's solution at that time was peer-based peer assessment. So you have to answer your question. Someone, two other people have to mark that question. And I think the system would flag uh, we'll let it through if, if those two marks are generally close to each other, but would flag if, if, if the marks are very different from each other, the grades are different from your peers marking this, and, and then a human would intervene. And that was certainly some sort of elegant solution. And of course, then became came all the electronic grading systems, uh, NB grader, etc. You know, if, if you do have uh, multiple choice type questions, these are easy for, for, for a machine to answer. And then also the ability then to give feedback to the student, to pro then provide extra material to the student, should they get this problem wrong. And um, um, I, I couldn't do it all. So there's obviously people at Coursera who dealt with this on my behalf. I just generated the content. So once again, being so fortunate to be surrounded by, you know, experts in, in their fields making a, a great success, success of this. So assessment, I think, is one big thing in the online space, which can get better. Mm -hmm. But is in certain fields at least a solvable and solved problem. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting to me because it's sort of another form of democratization, isn't it? It's not only letting new and different students in who otherwise wouldn't have been able to get in, you're letting more and different perspectives of instructors into oh, yes. this field. By, how by what I think how important is that, you know, um, bad political history in a country like South Africa, horrible, horrible history. And um, living myself through a change in the faces of the students sat in front of me, you know, through horrible history and, and, and the, you know, 
you know, historical, the pri you know, depriving people of education, what a horrible time. And uh, I was also very fortunate, you know, to from a very early age being active in that space and being surrounded by people active in that space and university active in that space, trying to fight that old system. And, and fortunately, that old system fell. And then coming to the realization, and, and, and perhaps this is not the, the you know, the best um, um, forum to discuss, you know, these issues, because these are deep political human issues and important issues. And, 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 and I'm not certainly not an expert in this, I, I know how I feel about it, and how I want to empower people. But as you see the faces of students change, I mean, that's an enormous change for a country to have gone through not many other countries, you know, have, have had that opportunity. And now to also to bring on board the faces, the, edu the faces of the educators that speak more directly to some of those students. What another opportunity that, that online education unlocked. Um, you know, there was a situation where you have to wait for someone to retire before you can get their post. You know, if someone is an academic post for the next 40 years, you know, how do you onboard the next generation? What opportunity as a brilliant educator do you give to them? And, and once again, online education helped at least you know, be part of that solution, bringing new faces uh, of education that understand their students so much better than I could ever understand the students. You know, there's students who understand me, there's, uh, uh, I understand some students, someone else understands another student better than I can ever understand. And how better is it? You know, I've, I have, I've had these conversations. Well, that professor is a leader in that field. Of course, he, usually a he, isn't it? Uh, you know, again, I have to shake my head. Uh, you know, and how bad we we are and, and used to be, and, and still so many problems we have. You know, we have to do better on. But well, it's an expert in the field. They must be the only person who can teach that nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You know, just to bring so many more people into the field of education, just speaks to so many more students in such a richer way. Absolutely. And, oh no! But someone else is already teaching this. Why must we have a second version of this? Of course, you must have a second version. You must have a tenth <laughs> version of it. You must have a hundredth version of. It. To have one version is to say that there's only one right way to think about this. Oh, no, you know, there's again that that that, that online space. How you know how much have my life been enriched by seeing an educator on YouTube? This is mm -hmm. YouTube. Right. What have I learned on YouTube from someone who's totally outside of my understanding of their cultural background, their country, and yet how much have I learned from them? Perhaps yes. the same coming in a different way that I would never have connected. But I'm just talking about me as a person, you know, fields of study that I have learned something new on that I would not have understood in a certain way. Now, I think, uh, John, I heard you in the last um, talk you had talk about the constructivist approach or, or theory, at least, of, sure. of, which I'm uh, absolutely sold on, of course, and, and I don't think there's a, you know, there's an argument there, but um, <laughs> How did, how did that person allow me to construct my particular version of this knowledge because they said it in a way, and if I had not connected with that from a totally different country on another side of the world that I know nothing about, this person just said something in a way that I, that spoke to me. How many times has that happened to me? And here we are, you know, 2023, look what is possible. Yeah, so that, that, that's exciting. a fantastic that's a fantastic point that um, pe you know people's uh, ability to relate to students uh, mm -hmm. really helps the students in terms of uh, understanding how the subject, whatever it may be, is going to be useful to them, is going to be relevant to them in their community. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I've talked about before the, the paradox of education, as I refer to it, that sometimes the more of an expert someone is on a topic, the less they can remember what it's like to be a student who doesn't understand aspects of it, to remember what parts of this are hard to understand for a newcomer. Sorry to interrupt you there, John, but I just yeah, I, John, I agree very that emphatically. Is, that, that is absolutely, I know I say, <laughs> Where am I to? No, that's absolutely correct. You know, to put yourself back in those shoes and to remember how long it took you to get to where you are now, suddenly you think, well, no, no, you should do that in a semester. Why don't you understand that? You know, that's a very difficult position to put yourself, you know, to put yourself back in those shoes. What, be honest with yourself, you know, what was my knowledge at that time? How much did I understand at that time? Let me look at my grades again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and even if they were good, you know, maybe that was just the assessment that was, uh, you know, smiling on you that day, I don't know. But um, 
um, it's very difficult to put yourself back in the position. And, 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 and no, I, under, I, I totally agree with uh, perhaps the more, you, you know, the more you know, the, the, the more the difficult, more difficult that becomes. Not always true, of course. You get the most brilliant people that are just the most brilliant educators as well. Absolutely, and, absolutely. But... Uh, that's, that's just a, a lovely, you know, lovely when that happens. Um, and of course, yep. today we have a brand new teacher in the in, in the classroom, and, and and of course that's generative AI models. You know, <laughs> and I suppose yes. we, we need to go there. Very true. Uh, real, real quickly before transferring to, to generative AI models, I, I'm curious. So, uh, since you've had these experiences in uh, helping to create uh, online course materials, what advice would you give for, let's say, a, a young uh, professor or maybe aspiring educator? They don't have to be professors because, as you were just mentioning, you know, we want to democratize this this spread of knowledge. So, what what are the sort of useful things that you would tell someone who is, you know, really excited now about the, the sorts of things that we've just been discussing and, and the opportunities that this affords for for democratizing knowledge and education? What what it, so how how does one go about getting into these sorts of things or what advice would you give a person who's just starting to, to think about creating these opportunities? Yeah. John, I think I, I, I might, might say a funny thing, become a YouTuber. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, how many excellent educational YouTube channels are there? You know, many, sure. many, many, many. How much have I learned from educators on YouTube? YouTube to me, the University of YouTube is a totally underestimated. YouTube should rank somewhere on time yes. higher. <laughs> Shouldn't it? It's not, you know, why, is, why are there no metrics for YouTube? Um, so I, I'm just using YouTube as a, you know, the other platforms of course as well. Oh, sure. uh, if you want to look for innovation, look around what people are successful and how are they doing it? You know, the examples are everywhere today. You can go on LinkedIn Learning. You can, uh, you, you know, go take a free course on a MOOC and see which ones are the ones successful. What are they doing? There's so many examples out there. So for mm -hmm. me, that's number one. Look around you. You will find a great way of doing it. And you will find a way that mm -hmm. speaks to you because not everyone has the ability to teach in every kind of way. I sit in a classroom and no matter how good I am, I know there's a student who's not going to connect with me. That's just numbers. We're just playing numbers here. That's, yep. that's not being possible. Um, which is perhaps another subject which approaches the fact that how much should you tell your students about other resources? You know, there are people know what I teach you and my notes, nothing out, nothing out, nothing other than that. That's absolute nonsense. But, um, um, and again, I'm generalizing, maybe perhaps, you know, there, there, there are the cases that it is not so, so forgive me for dramatizing in a way, uh, but. In um, my personal opinion, I, 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 as a generalization would agree, right? That yeah, as an I, educator. I think all of our philosophies is to make people aware of as many resources as possible so that yeah, they can yeah. find the ones that, that really allow them to connect to the material. But my and favorite quote about this is is saying uh, the worst kind of education is the transferring of information from the notes of the instructor to the notes of the student without passing through the minds of either. No, 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 no. That, that you, creating a carbon copy of your knowledge in someone else's head, that's a, that's a fairy tale. You know, that, right. As you say, that bypasses the head of that <laughs> the person completely. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I, I, I uh, you know, I, I have learned people like yourself agreeing with me. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, um, I suppose I, we've talked, we've spoken about so many things now. I've forgotten where we are at the moment. I, uh, um, we on we, board, we on board me again. We were sure. talking about advice for people who are interested in starting out oh, yes. in online education and with an intention to talk about AI after that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm naturally just going to I'm naturally just going to go there. But yes, so there are examples out there. And again, just as there is for for the students, so there is for the teacher. You know, ample uh, advice out there. And then the other beautiful thing, if you have that ability, and and now I'm going to turn into a salesman again, and I'm going to you know sing lyrical songs about the University of uh, George Washington University, and specifically the the Milken Institute School of Public Health. I mean, the public health school here, one of the leading schools of public health in the world. I have landed in amongst the most phenomenal people that I can ever imagine. And, and I've worked with phenomenal people, with phenomenal surgeons, you know, in, in, a, in a place with a phenomenal history. I have for I this is the greatest luck I've ever had in my life is landing amongst these people. These are just phenomenal people. The doors that you can knock on with the greatest enthusiasm, experience, knowledge, capabilities is just enormous. You can knock on so many doors and people will just help you. It's just in, the most incredible thing, you know, and, and, and that goes for a teacher, for a researcher and for a student. It's just, it's just 
it's un, it's not discovered so if anyone's ever interested come to the come to the school of public health at, at george washington university so forgive my salesmanship on that one but i speak from the heart and saying what a you know what a phenomenal place so if you're in that fortunate position and uh, you know your early career wanting other than research want to do education as well it's just to reach out there's just so many people around you if, if you're that fortunate that will help you along the way. That will give you those opportunities. You know, that will that that will really go out of their way, despite you know all the stresses in their own life, to help you succeed in that field. Because in in a place like this, you know, there's an enormous sense of let's make the students succeed. You know, these are important students. They are the leaders. You know, they are going to shape healthcare policy in the future. They are going to contribute. Let's put them in the best possible position. It's so important what is happening here. We realize its importance. Let's do the best job that we possibly could. And perhaps, you know, at wherever you are, you are going to find those people. So it's all it's all around you if you really want to look. And if you're in the fortunate position, like here at GWU, there's just so many doors to knock on. You know, this it's just phenomenal. Great. So uh, you, you brought up the topic of uh, the new instructors that are, are now part of the classroom, which are, are large language models. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, how, how has the advent of this new uh, way of interacting with computers uh, influenced uh, and affected teaching where you are? Now, let's let's be honest with ourselves. Too early to tell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> too, Absolutely. Early, too early to tell. Of course, there's the initial inertia. Mm -hmm. There's the initial fear, and I think uh, uh, you have already spoken about that in, in, in previous discussions about, uh, you know, about the fear, perhaps that's human nature. We were afraid of the first car, you know, and some of us thought the car was going to go away because this thing is uncomfortable and it bounces and it makes noise. So perhaps next year the car will go away and we'll be back in our elegant wagons drawn by a horse, you know, mm -hmm. and um, there's so many uh, examples of this. I, I am not a reader of the future. I don't have a crystal ball, but I can't imagine this genie ever being put back in the, in its lamp. It is out. This, the horses have bolted. AI, generative AI, uh, you know, um, let's say Star Trek and saying, computer, what is this? <laughs> we, we have we have that, uh, you know, in, in our culture as far as television entertainment is concerned. But um, um, I, I cannot see that generative AI is suddenly going to not be important. I think we have we had a beautiful sure. example in South Africa where the Prime Minister in 1975 said that TV is just a fad, and, we'll just, <laughs> and hence television was introduced very late in South Africa. You know what a what a way not to see the future. But um, it is there. And we have to embrace it. And but it's so young. It is so new. You know how, how can we ever? I think it'd be slightly arrogant to think where where this is going. So for me, uh, I want to see, I want to explore the ways that it can benefit the student and me, uh, you know, as, as the, the, the teacher, you know, how, how, how can we bring it together? So yes, we have started some projects. Um, I have a, an unofficial blog that I put most of my stuff on at the university, so I cannot speak on behalf of, of GW. This is all my own personal, you know, everything that I say is my own personal point of view. Uh, but um, so there are some experiments that we have started in our department that I'm working on. And uh, the, the first one will be on linear algebra, of all things. Um, linear algebra, of course, if, if, if you're serious about data science, um, you know, linear algebra, is, my belief is that that should be your first port of, port of call. Mm -hmm. And so how can I introduce uh, topics of linear algebra by making it dynamic through the use of a large language model? <laughs> So the problem for me at the moment is, and, and it's being overstated, no one is expecting you just to learn from a large language model, which right. is by one of the one of the products, the Coca-Cola of, uh, of, uh, of uh, generative AI. Yep. Right. Um, In fact, they're usually discouraging that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, modesty. But um, uh, you, you know, you, you cannot just rely on it if you at the moment if you don't have some background knowledge. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for those of us with the background knowledge, it's very difficult for us to see the use of it in someone who's encountering a subject for the first time. How would right. they interact with ChatGPT? So that or, or a large language model, generative model. You, you can't expect that thing just to teach you if you don't know. Now, I, you know, we talk about hallucinations. We talk about the fact that it makes mistakes. I think we overemphasize it in, in as much as where's this belief that it has to be 100% correct? 
you know, because people certainly aren't who, right. you know, who, because people aren't you know so wait wait why, why do we make the bar for ai so so high you know why do we set the bar so high so yes it's, it's going to make mistakes going to hallucinate you have to have at the moment some background knowledge just to you know to verify what it is saying so there is a problem there that we have to deal with. So I cannot just relinquish my teaching to ChatGPT or a large language model to do all of that. I, I certainly cannot do that. So I have to somehow um, guide use, but it's by making use of it actively in the classroom that I feel the students now are learning two things. They're learning about the subject matter and they're learning the interaction with this model as it stands in 2023. It might be very different in a couple of years time. You know, maybe one day we'll have the brain implants and have to, you know, have the ability to talk. <laughs> Who knows? To um, may it come before before I leave this planet. But uh, um, um, at the moment, it's it's clunky. You have to type. Uh, of course, if you have it on your cell phone, you, cell phone, you can speak to it. Um, but yes, let's let's use it. It is unfortunately an extra level of you know something else that you're adding to the burden of um, of the topic that you're actually trying to teach. But yes, yeah, for me, it's the important thing at the moment. If if you are a student and you're reading your textbook and start on page one, flip over to page two, you have a thought. That textbook is so rigid, it will only go to the next page. Yeah. There's nothing else it can do. It can answer your question, page can it? To page three. Yes, something that I'm curious now, I wonder, maybe I can ask something. That The large language model is not rigid like a textbook. It is not rigid like a pre-recorded uh, lecture and perhaps it's it's even less rigid than a teacher who now has one hour ten minutes or perhaps three hours our, our postgrad lectures are three hours long you know how do you uh, perhaps you don't have enough time in those three hours to go where every student wants to go so perhaps the easiest way to incorporate this is to say let me show you how it works by legitima legitimizing it in the classroom because your teacher is using it it's legitimized in your head now as something official somehow let me show you actively instead of me firing a lesson plan we're just going to let go where our minds go so if i start using vectors what 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 of course you know the subject so you know what has to come out in that lecture but somehow can you let there be this freedom of thought get the answers from live from chat gpt of course as the teacher you're guiding this whole process but perhaps that is a, a good skill to teach a student that when they do then use this independently, you know, that they've seen how it works, that they understand what the limitations are. And now it's not a substitute for you as the teacher. It is not this, this thing that you're inflicting on the student and hoping for, you know, closing eyes, hoping for the best that the answers they get is the right answer. So my first experimentation in this field is, can I somehow surf this wave of curiosity that I'm trying to instill in the student, mm -hmm. we ask a curious question about what we've just discovered. Can I use a large language model and then help them, you know, do proper prompt engineering, which is becoming a big thing. I've written about that as well. Um, you know, just a, a sort of a guideline for our students, how, you know, what prompt engineering is about. And hopefully, you know, that was put together <laughs> with, uh, uh, you know, would help them a little bit. But can I demonstrate that in class so that I can know that I'm at least getting them to, to, to or, 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 you know, hopefully getting better answers for them on their behalf when they do experiment on their own. And I'm hoping that the less rigidity that's in that system versus a textbook or some other resources that they have, say YouTube with a pre-recorded, you know, lecture by someone, that their natural curiosity, yes. um, you know, can be, can be fueled. I'm hoping that that should happen, but I don't want to be arrogant right now and saying, you know, this is the solution. This is where it's going to go. This is what's going to happen. But for us to embrace it, absolutely, we have to embrace Wonderful. it. We have, to, we have to explore how this, we, how we can use this new thing called a, a motor car with an engine and four wheels. <laughs> we have to explore right. where it takes us and look where it's taken us, you know, and 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 and, and that's where we, for me, that's where we're at at the moment. Now, there's only four minutes left in our official time, but thank you so much for telling us before this started that you can go a little bit over. We look forward to taking this conversation a little further because this is all fascinating. I want to ask, it, it, it before we go off of AI, which I'm not sure, John, you might have more to ask about that, but before we have a chance to, I wanted to tie it back into something that you mentioned that I connected to very strongly, that that teaching is so much about expressing and nurturing enthusiasm, 
mm-hmm. for the topic. And I I definitely connect with that statement. I, I have long believed that's essential for teaching. I believe that students can smell fake enthusiasm, that they may not know what they're reacting to, but they react badly to it. And that if you don't think you can get enthusiastic about a topic that you're teaching, that you're not exploring it deeply enough, that there is always something really mm-hmm. beautiful about anything that's true. And mm-hmm. so it's it's absolutely something that teachers should be doing as much as possible. Well, I wanted to ask, with all of that information there, do you think AI can encourage enthusiasm? Do you think there is anything about its inherent artificiality that would prevent it from doing that? Or do you think it's possible? Well, if, if the first part of your, well, not your question, but perhaps just your statement is, I think we're in the fortunate position, if you think about higher education, that you have someone who selected that subject, actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are some subjects that they absolutely have to take, you know, that's part of that, and perhaps the enthusiasm is not there. Our first our first priority is do not kill that enthusiasm. Yes, because yes. I mean, most people walk into that classroom with enthusiasm, and the worst thing you can do is to stand in the way of that enthusiasm. To, and, and some of our education systems throughout the world are geared absolutely towards killing enthusiasm. <laughs> I want to be you know, honest. A lot has changed. You know, a lot has been improved. Let's, you know, let's, let's tip our hat and say, you know, we, we, we are not in, in, in the 60s or 70s or earlier. You know, maybe it was great then. I wasn't around. But um, um, let's not kill that enthusiasm. Let's nurture that enthusiasm. Can an AI model do that? I don't know where this is going to go, Noah. I think, I think, of course. Now let's look at these. They tricked you into thinking that you know there's some thought behind that. It's it's right. our human nature to be tricked by a, you know there's a, some kind of passing of a Turing test here, <laughs> to some extent, um, and it, it tricks you into thinking that it is understanding what you're saying. It's under, and who knows what ver- the next version is going to look like? Who knows what the version after that is going to look like? And perhaps. You know, we have the ability now, you do even if you do the simplest prompt engineering, it's going to answer you in a different way. And perhaps there are settings that will answer you in a way that particular to you because you've interacted with it a lot, perhaps next time around it knows more about you. You know, there's so much of our data out there now, but maybe perhaps in your interaction in the future, it will get better, better in understanding what you connect with better because maybe you know, there's some measurement or some metric about your update, you know, your response to its response. Maybe there's something in there to explore. Um, um, and perhaps it can get to a stage, you know, where this becomes a bespoke interaction designed specifically for you in, you know, learning what benefits you as an individual. Now, we tried to do that. I think Sal Khan from the Khan Academy, the wonderful work, you know, that they had done, that he had done initially, and, and, and the projects that they still run, whereby the responses are somehow tailored towards where are you struggling? You know, as far as I understand, their system is set up that way it's going to give you extra uh, work in the areas that you're struggling with. And perhaps the AI could just be that. Perhaps the AI, a uh, generative AI, uh, you know, can be a much better teacher than any one of us can by that ability to give 100% individual <laughs> attention to you instead of. 30, 40 or more students, you know, sat in front of you, which which one human being can definitely not do. I'm curious to see where this is going. I am I I am very enthusiastic to see. So, which... so the answer is that whatever it can do, it will surely get better at it. Uh, I, I cannot see that, you know, anything but that statement being mm-hmm. true. Uh, I'm likewise optimistic about the ability to use tools like this for helping students to ride that wave of curiosity as you described it, right? Because mm-hmm. it, that's a, it's a very good metaphor, right? Where the, the students, uh, you know, interest is sort of peaking as they're getting into a subject and, and you know, anything that lets them explore where their own questions are taking them is, is a potentially mm-hmm. really great way of going mm-hmm. about uh, letting them find their way to a new subject. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, you also mentioned one of the uh, supports that you put in place in your classroom, which is this guide to, uh, you know, how do I prompt this thing to get better sort of results? Um, what are the other supports that either you already put into place or, or you, you know, through your experiments, are starting to suspect might be useful uh, in, in terms of allowing students to sort of ride this wave? Because one of, one of the other paradoxical things sometimes is that in order for the students to have a very... Um, free exploration about where uh, you know their mind wants to take them it actually does require a fair amount of of support structures in place to allow that to be as successful as it can be and mm-hmm. so what what sorts of uh, supports um, you mentioned the the guide to prompting uh, did you find is helpful in this area 
Yes, definitely. It's so we. It's early days. It's very early days. <laughs> I do not have five years experience and can tell you what works. Right. And what, no one what does. And so uh, again, what a wonderful time to be part of this. You know, we 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 have to think carefully about this and. Perhaps the con, you know, people with conservative mindsets, you know, wanting to say just slow down. You know, we have to listen to them. Just don't don't jump in. We we have a you know a saying in in, in healthcare and medicine: first do no harm. You know, before you try and help some another human, first do no harm. So let's try not to harm. Let's be very vigilant about what we're doing and what we're introducing. Very vigilant. Let's be critical. Let's come together as academics. And perhaps form uh, interest groups, research, you know, research this. Of course, we've got to set this up as research, but uh, but perhaps put in place committees, working groups, etc., to to monitor what is going on here, to actively engage with the students. You know, there must be some metric about where this is going, how well it's doing. Um, let's not just, you know, we can't, we can definitely not have free reign, no matter how enthusiastic some of us are. are you know, early adopters usually are. Um, you know, we have, I think there's some constraint is, is definitely yeah, show me numbers, for, definitely called for the second. No, I say, show me numbers, show me yeah. numbers. Yeah, no, they, they, there's got to be measurement. This, you know, this is an academic pursuit. Of, you know, I'm, I'm, that's my field and academia, you know, not, 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 not in corporate, but you know, the natural inclination is, uh, you know, let's research this. Let's see, let's see what is happening now. It's very difficult. You, you really don't want to make your student the subject of your, you know, experimentation. That's just very, very <laughs> yeah. wrong. Up to, um, although, of course, in reality, they always are. Yeah. yeah. And there's this yeah. other uh, aspect, which, you know, is sometimes called action research, right, where educators are encouraged to, you know, frame because, you know, mm -hmm. there's always you you think of five different ways of presenting the same thing with every new batch of students that you get. Right. And so yes. you know, figuring out for yourself, which, which, you know, who is going to resonate, do I think best with each of these different mm -hmm. ways of presenting it is sort of a, a real mm -hmm. research problem that yeah. educators are confronted with every single year. But we do so, understand so, what you're saying, that you don't yes. want to be throwing methods at a student yes. that you think have a, yes. a high chance of spectacularly failing. Or right. Like that. Uh, and killing the enthusiasm, most of all, and, and adding to their burden. You know, students yeah. have an enormous burden. And, and I think it's much worse now than when I was a student. And, and I think there's not enough, uh, perhaps, always uh, um, understanding of that the stresses on, in, 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 in life today is, is different from when I was a student. Absolutely it is. And absolutely mm -hmm. it is. And we have to be cognizant of all of that. Which I think and when you were power. a student, they were monumental to, as well. <laughs> they were, they were. Um, looking back at it now, what a bunch of fun. What a you know, best time of your life. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, sure. Connecting with this new knowledge. But the, the important thing that you that you uh, made, made me think of then now is uh, um, onboarding the students. They are equal partners in all of this, are they not? You know, we, we, we should not hold all the reins and make all the decisions here. Right. We learned that lesson in healthcare, I think, quite some, quite some time ago. I think it was a Swedish student, perhaps it was Sweden. Um, I'll have to check, double check on that, who gave a very interesting talk. You know, it went viral on YouTube of uh, their system of the student being co designers of their curriculum, their healthcare, their, their, their medical curriculum. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, um, many places in the world, and I had gone through that experience personally, where we were forced to redesign the, 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 the medical school curriculum from the ground up, saying that this was so ancient, this was so ill-designed for an era that does not exist anymore. And going through that pain of redesigning a whole curriculum, forcing a whole faculty, you know, a whole a body of faculty, the whole school to introduce new material, teach it in a new way, it's a painful process. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the biggest things, and 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 uh, you know, uh, one of the former deans, may he rest in peace, unfortunately, took his own life. Uh, you know, and, and and I think what the system had done to him, just to force him to that, the burden that was on that man. But what a fantastic human being that was. But his drive was so absolutely at that time, um, to 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 bring students into that decision making process. So they sit around that table with all the experts from education, the field experts, so the surgeons and the gynecologists, etc. My example, and the students sit around that same table, equal partners in the design of the new curriculum. They understand what they need. They understand how they need it. They understand much better than you understand. That's the, my experience of that is 100%. I do not live in their world. I, how can I understand that? I understand my side of this equation. 
um, but they must be equal partners in this. And that's a very not exciting other, uh, other thing. I'm also, again, in a very fortunate position where students actually just reach out and they want to be part of some experimentation. Well, we, we, we hear you're going to do the summer thing. Can we, you know, can I sign up? Because, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they shape, uh, you know, to some extent what is happening there. So I, I think for me, the student is, is, is absolutely an equal partner in this. They are, they are the ones paying for this. You know, do you walk into, a clothing Absolutely. store, you walk into a clothing store and say, you know, here's my $50 and the, and the store manager says, no, that thing that's torn and that's the one I'm going to give you. Well, it's my money. I, I want this better one. No, no, you can't. Yeah, I, sh I, I should have on. to figure out what fits me, yes. shouldn't I? You should. <laughs> yes. I, th th there was a comment in uh, from our audience right now that I wanted to make sure we got in um, to the <clears throat> interview somehow. And this seems like a very apt moment someone said one advantage of asking an ai versus a human back from when we were talking about using ai as teaching tools and learning tools uh, is that you don't have to worry about stupid questions that may also be a source of imaginative exploration and i think that's a great point in and of itself but i think the fact that that point is being made right now shows that there are students out there who have questions who have things they don't understand want to know about and also think that that means something is wrong with them. That they I think we've think, all we've all been there at one point or another, right? I mean, we, even I, though we intellectually know as educators that that's not the case, it's it's a very uh, difficult uh, thing to break the habit of sometimes. It right? is, but the, but this sort of idea of opening up the curriculum to design by students, I hope would help to dismantle that, to be able to say at least at some level, what you want to know about is what you should be taught. That it's that it is not just about the questions that someone else wants you to ask, the information someone else wants you to have. Mm -hmm. That that this sort of approach, I hope, you know, maybe it's pie in the sky, but I hope it could help to break that I, down. I, so I, thank you so much yeah, for, for making that, steps in that direction. No, but, but anyway, whoever made that comment, thank you very much. I mean, that 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 that's an yeah. excellent, absolutely excellent comment. Absolutely. You know, the that, user's name that, was Antipass. So excellent. Thank you, and 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 and, and uh, I one hundred percent agree. You know, there's this big, so such a big fear in me, and, and perhaps that there's one thing we haven't mentioned before is who who in that classroom is not getting what I'm saying now. Yes. You know, how can I elicit that person? Where is that person? I look out for that person so much, and I know, of course, by pure numbers, I'm going to fail somewhere, somewhere along the line. There's someone who's not going to understand. And once again, what steps have we taken? You know, from previously. Uh, I think before you had spoken about uh, in, 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 in uh, um, other uh, of these uh, live casts was about uh, formative and summative assessment. Right. Once again, I want to bring that back to my own little world of, of, of medical education with the residents. You know, we, we have these high stakes events called the final exam. Oh, and the amount of stress that that had. I come from a world where to one part of your final exam is to actually operate on someone and being judged by people watching you operate. And thank goodness we got rid of that. How bad is that for the person being operated upon? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Absolute craziness was that because no know, one's at their best. <laughs> you are not at your best when you are being judged while you're operating, you know. And we got rid of that. Thank goodness. And 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 what a silliness was that? But anyway, high stakes event, a totally artificial. If you think about the knowledge that you want to impart and the skill that you want to impart, or put someone at least on that path, because. I remember when I first, you know, qualified either med school or being a surgeon, I couldn't do everything. I didn't know anything. It took years after that. And yep. so is it for most of us. Okay. Now, um, now you put someone at that, in that very artificial final exam, that is not what their life is going to look like. Mm -hmm. That is not what real life is going to, that's not the, you know, the, the punches that, that are going to be throw at, thrown at them or, or how, you know, the, how they're going to work. In most cases, it's a very artificial thing, this final exam. And such a high stakes event, if you don't pass it, the consequences are enormous. Mm -hmm. In the field of medicine, at least where I come from, we really try to move away from that as far as residency was concerned, is this continuous assessment of, of an individual. It's too late to find out at the end of the year or the end of the semester that someone didn't find. It's too late. You, you've lost, you know, yeah. and, and it's not a, to me always, someone must take responsibility for that and for me always i feel very strongly that was my failure my mistake if a student couldn't do well or didn't pass i failed i that's the first port of call not the student where did you know 
that's just a thing for me. And I think many people, you know, do the same. Where did I fail? Where did the system fail? And one of those things is just leaving it too late. Too late to find mm -hmm. out now. Someone doesn't know. So I again, that thing is can can I, I want to agree with this? And, and maybe now you've lit another fire in me again from that comment. Is that can can how can I incorporate finding that student? You know, who's now not going to put their hand up and ask a question. Especially you know, the bigger the class goes, the, the that goes out the door. You know, everyone being given the opportunity or, or want to put their hands up. You can't ask everyone. Close your eyes and someone can put their hand. Yeah. What crazy way can I come up with, with with just getting people to ask a question that they would otherwise not have? So yes, maybe let's put in more effort and thinking. Can I do let them explore with AI mm -hmm. when I've empowered them to do so on their own? Um, but once again, all boils down to how can I keep the spark alive? They came in there with a roaring fire, and you know, by the end, it must not just be this little trail of smoke. You know, <laughs> coming out. You, you had mentioned co-design as uh, you know a really exciting part of. Uh, figuring out this new world of incorporating things like like chat gpt and and large language models uh, all sorts of models into the classroom uh with the appropriate caveat that co-design doesn't mean that you know one group of students co-designs and then everybody does this right but, mm -hmm. but with that caveat aside um you know what what are some interesting suggestions that you've had from students that you've worked with in terms of this co-design of, of what these sort of future directions might look like um, again, not 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 the forum for this. Um, mm. um, my personal experience had got, been going through a redesign of a medical curriculum, mm -hmm. um, um, enforced by government and government mm -hmm. regulations, just recognizing the fact that 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 was designed. And unfortunately, this comes back to politics and the bad politics of apartheid. Mm. And um, so, so maybe I should go there because we can't hide. You know, you can't hide from the truth. Whereby, um, you know, medical students are forced to. Uh, attend a clinic in you know far away from say the academic hospital there, there are all these um, um, community clinics that they have to go to that's mm -hmm. designed for a cohort of previously advantaged students who all got a car they, oh. they and um, you know had the ability to pop out to a restaurant and buy their food and you've got a brand new cohort of students whose parents did not buy them a car who can't pop out to a restaurant and just buy lunch for themselves and now, uh, in in the in the early years of 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 the new democracy, it was well, you're going to be penalised because you didn't show up. Uh, mm. to the, you didn't show up. Um, you know, you're a bad student. You are going to be reported. I'm going to, you know, it's going to be negatively affect your grades. You are a lazy student. Look at you, you lazy. And that's absolutely the truth that happened in the early days. And, and so that's for me is a visceral example of absolutely enforcing a redesign and a rethink of, you know, that's a very tangible, I think anyone can understand, but it goes much more subtle than that. It goes, you know, there's so much more nuance to, um, you know, what you go into a curriculum, what the background is of someone who comes in, the struggles that they have, which you just cannot, don't fool yourself and think you yep. can understand that. That's arrogant yes. in the extreme. Yeah. And for me, the, the just, you know, having, having gone through that and listening to these voices, listening what they come up with, some things that I could never even fathom or think. And, and if I look at the curriculum now as being part of, you know, having worked towards that new curriculum, is, is it perfect? No, it's not. Can we ever, you know, should we always just stop because everything is now perfect? No, no, you know, we, we always carry on. But the changes that were brought in and, and, and how it is now, you know, trying to empower a, a generation of new healthcare workers in that setting. Let's just talk about the successes of, you know, what happened in a country or in a region um empowering people who had the power to start off with had the ability to start off with was probably better than the majority of the people who were empowered and were doing it before that um you know just to unlock well, how, how do you mean i I'm, I'm not sure i understand what you what you mean by I'm, that. I'm saying apartheid was so bad there were people with such great abilities and they never got the opportunity to yes. express that ability and so let's use that as a horrible example, which unfortunately I was born into. I had no choice. I, as the saying goes, I felt the need to be near my mother during my birth. But you know, so, <laughs> so there you are. That's where you are born. Um, not agreeing from a young age, having parents who didn't agree with the system. You're not agreeing with the system. You know, did, did, did what you could, um, and feeling bad because you always feel you never did enough. But living through that experience of um, unlocking 
uh, or, or not unlocking the potential is always there. That ability was always there. That mental power, mental capacity, skill, innate ability to do all of this artificially not being allowed. Right. Because, mm-hmm. because, of, uh, because of the laws of a yeah. country. Right. Um, uh, and then to have lived through the unlocking, of, not the unlocking of that, just to, to take those shackles off. Uh, and it was not unlocked. It was always there. You know, just to take, take away the artificial barrier to that and see all these brilliant people suddenly everywhere. And again, and again, then, then that innate need to empower that generation to go out and solve healthcare issues by being able not only to serve the patient by standing at their bedside, but also answer some questions through research, um, you know, with diseases that they fully understand because they faced with that every day, there's a different burden of disease in one country from another country. I spoke about trauma, the interpersonal violence uh, is, is, is on an unfathomable scale in certain parts of the world. And, yeah. uh, um, you know, in, in the research, the, the answers to those are not going to come from uh, uh, a country in Europe, you know, we, we, with all due respect, it's, it's going to come from someone who, who's, in my instance, doing four, five, six laparotomies for gunshot wounds to the abdomen every night. That's how I spent my residency. I, under, I felt like I understood that problem. You know, I can research that problem. And, and, and that's a you know, tiny visceral example. I'm talking tuberculosis. I'm talking about HIV. You know, people who understand not only the disease, but the patients with that disease, they are the ones who must come up with those solutions, you know, the, through research. And you know, just having played a tiny little part in, 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 in making that possible, you know, f- using the Wolfram language which is what I did and showing them how, you know, how to start their, their research career, even though they are clinician scientists, that's, that's what I dealt with, uh, you know, was, was, was my co- cohort of, of, of residents. Um, yeah, so again, for me, very, very powerful having gone through that experience, feeling enormously guilty from being born in, into that, mm-hmm. you know, there's a certain amount of that that you carry around with you. And always, and always will, and but we all have our burdens all over the world, and 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 of course today the wars that we still see today, how one human being can do that to another human being is unfathomable to me. I have to stay quiet about it because if those doors open, whoever comes in, I have to operate. I can't make those judgments, and, and other people have the ability to do that much better than I can. But um, um, to 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 see to see people's potential being given the opportunity to shine. I think there can't be anything more beautiful in the world. Yes. So something that if I understand correctly, um, you care a lot about is uh, open communities and being able to be able to, uh, you know, have uh, exchange of information and uh, code, for example, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I was wondering if, if uh, you might be able to talk about um, both your involvement in terms of open source projects, and also you, you've mentioned many times that you found Wolfram language particularly helpful in terms of uh, you know starting research questions. Uh, what are some of the ways that you use Wolfram language along with some of these other uh, platforms? Because you know, I, I agree, you know, speaking many languages is good. So being able to write code in um, several languages is also good. Yes. Yes, I'm going to just, as I did before, equate that to the spoken language. You know, if you are polyglot, you know, empower, I can speak two languages very, very well, and the third one a little bit, and I so wish I could speak more languages. That's just such an empowering thing to do. And then mm-hmm. the same goes for computer languages. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some languages, I mean, there's, there are these, I think, no, we spoke about it before in, in a previous meeting where we just spoke about uh, the ratings that there are for languages. Yeah. You know? Uh, the different ones they are extremely um, artificial as far as i'm concerned we spoke about for instance just the exceedingly good documentation that exists for the wolfram language i mean there, mm. there's no better than the wolfram documentation let's be honest i don't think that's you know that's that's a point that i would argue with anyone and that, that the documentation is either so, talking about to show me numbers i believe it's the world's largest documentation of a software there language go. there you go and and so you know do you need to reach out to youtube uh, video to answer your question no, you don't, because the it's right there. If, you know, it's right there at your fingertips. Um, should should there be more YouTube videos out there? Um, again, forgive me for 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 YouTube. Uh, I mean, for me, it's the biggest search engine. Understood. It, it, it's a shorthand for all yeah. these various resources. Is yeah. there a new generation who, you know, I think that the 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 the, the you know, I'm a visual learner. That's nonsense. We, you know, we've all seen the research on that uh, mm-hmm. work. But there's some things that you perhaps like more than something else. Are we seeing a new generation who just expect everything to be in a short video? 
you know, it's TikTok and all those. I'm not on TikTok. How would I know? But anyway, you know, are we are, are we seeing a generation who perhaps don't want things in documentation, want it in a different way? Mm -hmm. um, of course, now we have, I mean, once again, congratulations, how quickly did the chat driven notebooks come out? Like, they weren't there and today they're there. That was fantastic. And a, a whole new field to explore, you know, do I even now need a YouTube video or the documentation? Well, I just use the chat enabled notebook, it's going to write the code for me, <laughs> you know. Um, so brilliant, brilliant new things, uh, uh, you know, coming down the pipeline. For me, that was, uh, I mean, that was implemented so well and so quickly. And, and, and it's not even as I understand, I mean, the next version of, of Mathematica, you know, will be even better. I'm, I'm quite sure it will be and, and, and even better integrated, but well done for where it stands right now, just out of nowhere. And again, sorry to bring back to that as well, the, the Wolfram plugin in ChatGPT, you know, what an initial enormous success and probably onboarded so many more people into the, you know, that otherwise wouldn't have bought. That was a fantastic decision to make and, and, and to make that plugin, by the way. But anyway, I digress. Um, onboard me again with where we were. Yeah, so I, I was curious, um, as, as we had mentioned, uh, and you were you know, sort of stating very eloquently that uh, you know, there, there's value in using all sorts of different tools. So what are some of the ways that, that you use Wolfram language along with other tools available? You mentioned R or Python or something like this. So what, what, are, what are some tips or, or ways that you uh, have found that you can uh, use these various tools that you have available together to you know, have a, a, a project which has gone from some research question to um, you know, doing analysis? Yeah. So, I mean, there are two parts, research and education. You've got to split the two of them up. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the research groups, a brand new one that we just started last week is, a, is, a, is doing, doing network analysis, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, as far as trauma surgery is concerned. And again, driven um, from the uh, authors of papers out of South Africa and doing network analysis and that, what we're trying to build is just to see you know, through pure graph theory, you know, where are those connections so that who can people reach out to if they want to further their research career and they aren't in, in Southern Africa, for instance, where are, you know, where are the vertices that make sense for them mm -hmm. uh, to do that. So suddenly, um, you know, working with a group of uh, clinicians who've never done graph theory in their whole lives. Mm -hmm. So just very simply putting together a couple of notebooks, onboarding people, you know, with the basics of, you know, what is graph theory? What is a vertex? What is an edge? You know, what is graph centrality? What, you know, what's an incidence matrix? So easy in the Wolfram language, you know. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's network X, I suppose, in, in, in Python, you can do that as well. But the implementation of so elegant, and, and I think you can, you know, that's one use case, but there's so many implementations in the Wolfram language that are so elegant with a tiny little bit of knowledge the beauty, of course, of, of just the notebook. I mean, of course, we have Jupyter notebooks, but the, the 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 long history that we do have with the computational essay with a notebook in Wolfram language. I think, um, you know, it's so it's it's such an, a a nice environment to work mm -hmm. in, it's such a non-threatening environment for someone who you're not trying to turn them into a coder, you're not trying to tur turn them into a someone who does graph theory for a living. Something they're a clinician, um, but. I, I find it personally just very easy to come up with a quick resource in a, in a research group and not even mentioning the fact that, you know, my research documents, you know, when we have our meetings, as far as our research projects is concerned, I am the meticulous one putting everything in a notebook, you know, it's such a nice environment, you know, make it look nice, mm -hmm. such a engaging uh, a format to present your work in and say, okay, this is where we stand with analysis and just showcase the work to your fellow, you know, people in your, in your research group with great, you know, some of them are pure clinicians, some of them are, you know, experts in some other field. And so if you're the one who's now also doing the biostats for that group, um, what an elegant way to, to have those meetings is around a notebook. It is, it is phenomenal. Now, so if you ask me, and that didn't come up, you know, what, what is the, what's the worst educational tool that ever existed? And that's PowerPoint. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you. I, oh, I look at the, I look at PowerPoint similarly to the way I look at nuclear weapons that uh, as long as oh. everyone else has it, yes, we have to like have it available, but it would be great to no. uninvent it. Wouldn't it just completely gone for everybody? That that would be so wonderful. It is the it is the overhead projector of the who who came up with it? The military, the U.S. military in the 1930s, 40s came up with the overhead projector. I'm actually not familiar with that history personally. That. Yeah, 
that is education from 1930 still exists today in the form mm -hmm. of PowerPoint. And mm -hmm. I, I have not used PowerPoint in, I cannot remember when I refused to. All my, all, everything I teach is done as a notebook. I do not come to class with a PowerPoint slide. Never mm -hmm. in your life. No, I like to write on the board. I would just start yeah. three hours light, later. I'm still sure. writing on the board. Something where you can change yeah. what you're showing and right. adapt to questions that are yeah. asked. Sure. And, and and again, the terseness of the language, the power of the design of the language, once again, you know, Stephen, well done. But, you know, a, a, a student asks something very quickly, can you just come up with brand new code on the spot? That's not a problem. And lo and behold, the manipulate function. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great one. They quickly make that. Uh, th you know what that student's asking. You know where they're going. Make it come alive on this yeah. big projector here above your head. You know, you make it come alive in front of them. And unfortunately, uh, you know, Jupyter, the, the, the widgets, the notebook widgets, they are difficult to work with. They are difficult. Mm. The manipulate function, there's nothing close in any other language than <laughs> the manipulate function. And uh, for me, that is just uh, how many times do I just rely on that? So I would come to class and I have the prepared. Uh, notebook. Mm -hmm. Now, this is School of Public Health. So, of course, Python and R, you know, uh, specifically R. Um, of course, yeah. Realistic about it. They, um, I, you know, they, we have two postgraduate courses, uh, Introduction to Python, Introduction to R. I teach both of those mm -hmm. um, because they are important in, in, in upskilling sure. or, or, or um, onboarding people for the work that they are going to do. These things are, are important. So, I'm not uh, we'll never ever say anything negative sure. about it. Like you said, as much as possible, you want to make the classroom similar to what they're actually going to be experiencing. Yes, so sure. Absolutely. But there is the fundamental, you know, postgraduate courses that you teach. And uh, um, there's, as for me personally, it's easier to make that come alive with the work. Mm. It's, it's, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, now, nothing wrong with the tool, which is very powerful and very complicated to use. It takes a long time for you to build what you want to build in order mm -hmm. to get it to do what it's doing. Nothing wrong with that, absolutely. But it really does limit your ability to be dynamic with it, right? And and yeah, that's exactly. that's such a thing in a class. Um, one so of the yeah, other we... things about the language design that um, one of our good friends at another university pointed out to me was that uh, if you look at what functions exist and you look at what uh, options exist for those functions, this can actually be a good way as a new learner. Let's say that you are a clinician who's dabbling in graph theory, right? You know, you, you're not necessarily wanting to dive into, you know, introduction to graph theory. You, you just need a working ability to do some things because it's relevant to your practice as a clinician, these research questions. But by by seeing the, the things that are sort of you know, a function and the, the options that the function has can help guide your exploration in terms of figuring out what do I need to know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought that was an interesting observation. I was wondering if you had any other examples like that, that, that had come up in, in uh, your, your teaching experience. Yeah. So um, for, I'm in a fortunate position to, we have a master studio, master studio, master student, master teacher academy. I'll get there eventually. I think I should stop talking now. But um, <laughs> Master Teacher Academy, um, which is, uh, you know, they take proposals um, mm -hmm. to solve educational problems, not through the, well, let's design a new course and it takes two years to get the course, you know, through the system and eventually. So this just allows you to solve problems dynamically by, um, I suppose, maybe it's akin to the MITx kind of thing. Um, um, which I'm not super familiar with, so it might be quite different. But so um, one of the problems that we see in the School of Public Health is mathematics, of course. You know, many students come uh, into public health and they did not, they were not math majors. Um, you know, so, uh, um, and suddenly they realize uh, through the, the different courses that they take, maybe their first postgraduate year, that, ooh, this is interesting and, and I want to pursue this. But maybe I feel I'm not going to take quantitative methods because, ooh, I'm worried about my mathematics. I'm worried about that, and I, or I have done it so long ago, I feel a little bit unsure. Can we create educational resources for that? So at the moment, I'm working um, um, basically complete would be one on algebra, because if we think about an introduction to biostatistics, you know, if you just look at how do you calculate the T statistic, you know, how do you mm -hmm. calculate the X squared statistic that follows the chi squared distributions? These are inherently, you can teach them as alg algebraic expressions. We don't have to go to the calculus, you know, for CDFs, etc. Sure. 
And so how in fact, the, the calculus enough? of like the normal curve or whatever is yeah. incredibly unfriendly yeah. as, as an equation. So how, do you, so. so how do you, you know, how do you upskill that uh, algebra just, you know, to make everyone still happy with a basic algebraic manipulation? And then I <laughs> spoke about the linear algebra, of course. And so, and then both multivariable, uh, single variable and multivariable calculus. So designing those educational resources for our students to tap into and um, they I've done them all in the in the Wolfram language. And so I'm a, I'm just abstracting away from the biostats a little bit. And so we're now talking the language of biostatistics, which is mathematics. And so can I empower and onboard someone very quickly as as rapidly as I can, once again, solving that 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 old problem that I've spoken about before and and making people feel comfortable again with their level of mathematics skills yes. and the hope in this is that people now feel oh it's going to be very easy for me now to take an advanced course in biostats i'm i remember integration i remember um you know my derivatives for a cost function and, and using gradient descent all those things oh of course this is what they are and so yes let's put those resources out there for our students i'm very fortunate to be able to work on that uh, you know creating those resources and um they are done and, and now i can divorce myself really from r because now i'm not teaching categorical data analysis categorical data analysis uh, i teach as well and that that is purely r based because there's so many of the packages and we're just preparing students you know there's work with the with the different governmental agencies etc so we do, we're doing this in r uh, that that class you know before i came was done in r i'm continuing doing this in r right um, because even if you and, can do this in the wolf from research yeah. uh, the wolf from language having all of these lessons written up i i, I completely understand yes. that it's a, it's an important resource yeah. to use yeah but then as i say this 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 new level of the support for our students that we are building out just updating their mathematics skills again again i don't think you can use uh, R for me will not solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Python with SymPy, with symbolic Python, can to some extent get you there. It, I think it's quite an elegant implementation, um, but it's never going to reach the level of a computer algebra system the same way as would the Wolfram language be. Uh, I, I think that's a point, uh, and no one can argue that, uh, you know, there's a, a subsection of the Wolfram language that is just geared towards um you know that fundamental yeah. work with mathematics i mean as far as linear algebra cal and calculus one, and algebra. You, you were describing the various languages that you speak and some of them being computer languages and i think i am going to be adding to your list when i suggest that mathematics is one of the languages that you speak mm -hmm. that it is its own language that it has its own uh, grammar its own rules its own poetry its own prose that it is a language one that discusses a specific topics usually, but it's a language. And of the various computer languages I've run into, Mathematica's language, Wolfram language's syntax, grammar, the way that it runs as a language is closest to math's language of anything that I've run into. Like it's it, you know how there are certain languages if you learn if you know English that it's easier to learn say French or Italian than it would be to learn Chinese. There are languages which are separate and ones which are closer to each other, and that's that's just always been my perception. Well, let's put mathematics in its proper sense. It is the language of the whole universe. <laughs> so let's go. Um, let's go. Um, yeah. I, I know, you know, I, I, it's the fundamental construct, I think, of the universe. If I put my, uh, forgive me, uh, you know, for the experts in the, in the, in the chat that are physicists <laughs> that have learned physics. Um, um, you know, Stephen there's something, there's something about mathematics that is it's just, it's the, the, you know, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. You know, there's all these nice sayings, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that have been uttered. But so, yes, it is a language. It's also the language of, of data science. It is the language of statistics. You have to be able to speak that language. Now, I want to fully agree with you. There's nothing also, saying so the manipulate function is my favorite, but very close to that is the... Uh, is the mathematics palette, <laughs> you know, to make an integral yeah. in code look like an integral. Come on, you know, how beautiful is that? That's just, <laughs> you know, one, that's, one of the things that's the thing of beauty. Yeah, one of the things I'm curious um, whether or not uh, you've uh, had occasion to use. Uh, so I personally, um, in things that I have done, have not had occasion to, to do all that much R personally. But, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, there is like an R link for being able to take working R code and, and run it in a, a notebook. So I'm, I'm curious if that's something that you have experimented with uh, much in, in your practice or, or if that's something that uh, uh, that you had anything to say about. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to say flat out no. I, okay, I, I haven't tried that one. Keep these things very, very separate, and and perhaps that's the wrong thing to do because yes, you you know you can run kernels of different languages in in, in different IDEs, etc. Mm -hmm. And it's something you know that that probably we should do you know we should do more of. I am unfortunately always been a purist, so if we're now talking R, we are talking R. If we're talking Python, we're talking Python. But um, well, and maybe maybe that's a shortcoming on my one side. One of the right? foundational really ideas mean. of Mathematica is that there's more than one right to, way to do mm -hmm. anything. So we're mm -hmm. not going to be prescribing that if it works, then it's one of the right ways. So yeah. absolutely, <laughs> use them separately, use them together, you know, whatever it is that's going to work for you. Oh, look, yeah, there they are important tools in, in, in certain fields. Um, SAS, of course, uh, we mentioned, we haven't mentioned here, of course, with the FDA, if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to present to the FDA, you have, you know, it's SAS and SAS only. Yeah, I got some you, opinions on SAS. We won't go there. Yeah. Um, it's Look, it is very, very important. Uh, um, you know, if that's what the FDA expects and, um, you know, that's the way that new medication, uh, everything is introduced by the work done uh, with SAS, then, then so be it. It's worked. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now we've got wonderful medications out there. The world of healthcare, you know, is, is part of the success story of, as far as, as humanity is concerned. And, and yes, so that language has played a role there because that's what, what, uh, what the FDA has accepted. Now, very recently, Nova Nordisk, um, um, they put out a podcast on a posit uh, um, website where they've made their first submission to the FDA successfully using R. Mm. And so I think uh, we might see a crack in that wall. Um, um, and uh, what, at the end of that, in, uh, at the end of that uh, podcast, what the, the, the statisticians at, at Nova Nordisk were saying is what they were surprised about. And, and of course, it should not have been a surprise, but the curiosity of the people at the FDA, you know, there's this perception, perhaps, and, and it's my perception, I might be completely wrong, that there's some level of rigidity that, but these are curious human beings, and they were yeah. just mm. curious to see how this would work in R. And they, you know, they met with people at Nova Nordisk, and Nova Nordisk, I think, from what I understand from that talk, is they were a bit nervous about this, or oh, they want to come see us in some punitive man manner, but it was not so. It turned out these were curious human beings, and they you know, reached out to Nova Nordisk, not in a punitive sense, but in let's explore this. Let's see. We want to learn as much as you want to learn. And perhaps, you know, there's, there's that crack in other languages will be allowed. And of course, if we talk about other food and drug administration type institutions all over the world, uh, not everyone is uh, connected to SAS in that way. You know, in many other um, 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 parts of the world, you can you can use other languages. So let's see. Let's see where this goes. But of particular interest to us with the FDA. Let's see where that goes. But, um, um, you know, R lends itself to that world. Uh, it is the world of public health. If you look just at the method sections of papers, you know, R is growing there rapidly. You know, as you know, the king of that world used to be SPSS, et cetera, which is another little, um, yeah, you know, I'll just remain positive about it. But uh, there again, I, I, I much prefer writing code to do my analysis and not push a button and, and, and have no control over what's happening. Yeah. But, um, 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 you know, you can see you can see the open source language is starting to make a big impact uh, when you just purely look at those metrics as far as healthcare and public health is concerned. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a, an equal place as far as I'm concerned for the Wolfram language, which which perhaps has never been pushed in this field that much. You know, it's not the language that you would perhaps in many places in the world when you have a school of public health be mentioned uh, that much. But I think we've spoken now about, you know, so many beautiful use cases in the instruction and, and, and of course, my experience on the research side of, again, of the Wolfram language has been able to, to do all of this. So there, there's a, a it's it's, yeah, there, there is a uh, specific question coming from the chat. I'd feel remiss if I didn't ask it. I, I definitely want to get back to talking about the more general things uh, as soon as possible. But there was a question, does Dr. Klopper have a recommendation for mathematic packlets specialized for circular statistics? Uh, their example is the assessment of biorhythms like circadian rhythms. Okay, let me throw that right back at the company <laughs> and uh, the gentleman representing the company. I and, have let, and let me say that I am going to look into this and post the answer both from Dr. Klopper and ourselves in the yes. comments under this video when if and when I have something uh, specific to recommend so yes so yeah watch please watch the space I'm pretty sure that exists but unfortunately you no know, I, I have not used that and I, I'm not aware of, of the existence but I'm if that's a question I'm sure someone has solved solved that we'll look we'll look for it 
it's interesting that you brought up this this um, use of uh, integrating large language models into the the notebook environment because actually um, we've uh, spoken at, at, at at least one school of public health recently about uh, the the new functionality to be able to have something that is you know automated come up with code and maybe you know the, the code might not be exactly right the first time every time it does it but it you know neither will it be if a human did it and so this is a great way to, to take people who are not aspiring to be you know experts in in software engineering right they're clinicians they're uh, public health uh, researchers they're they're people who you know have research questions that drive them but the the actual coming up with the code is probably not the most interesting part of their job as far as they're concerned right and so uh, have, having this ability to uh have not only as a teaching tool, but but even to suggest new ways of doing something with a language that you may or may not have great facility with uh, at your current level of learning uh, is a great new opportunity that's available to everyone. Mm. Um, I mean, and let's watch the space once again. What is version 14, what's version, version 15 going to look like as far yeah. as how, we, how are we going to interact with coding or computational thinking or data analysis in the future? We, we don't know where this is going. If I, if I can venture a guess, it is again going to democratize people's ability to mm -hmm. do this work because they are now not stuck in the uh, you know sometimes esoteric construct of a language mm -hmm. you know r is specifically not the easiest thing to learn when you see it the first time you know or with a tidyverse dialect you know um, which you know some people love and some people don't love um, you know complicates you know when you don't have a single design philosophy as far as your language is concerned you know you have base r and you have the tidyverse and these things are, are different and uh, so the onboarding there you know you almost have to double your efforts now because you know there's you you know do you do this in base r do you do this with, with tidyverse principles and um mm. so there's something to be said about a coherent language design i think which again is one of the success stories of the wolfram language being mm -hmm. built from the ground up uh, you know an extremely an extremely elegant and, and, and proficient way um, but who knows where this is going to lead uh, and how, how is that going to broaden the ability for a domain expert in their field to solve their problem um, easier in the future and not have to take up their precious and valuable time to learn the minutiae of a new language, you know, and something that they don't want to do and they don't like. So let's see, you know, let's see where this goes. As far as I'm concerned at the moment, it's already brilliant. You know, I have... I have now personally, as you say, we all have bugs in our code. I didn't just sit down and write beautiful code and all the analysis just works. And that, that, that right. Thing. I have used now the chat, uh, chat driven notebooks. And I have now asked the large language model to write my Wolfram language code, code quite a few times. And you know what? It works. Yeah. <laughs> it's made fewer mistakes yep. than I have. And I did not have to go to the documentation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Funny. I mean, th th this is this is the next step of the philosophy that Stephen Wolfram was espousing when he first designed this language, these programs that he designed. That he was looking at a computing environment where you would have to define addition in order to do it, or download a packet of someone else's definition of that in order to do it in a computer. And he just thought that was ridiculous, that you mm. should be able to have a program that does all these things you already understand in mm. a computational way. Mm. And that you you shouldn't have to be going outside of your understanding of the math that you're doing, of the science that you're doing in order to use it with a computer. And now it's going even further in exactly that direction saying, yes, we have a great language. We have a great coding language that people can use. It's much more intuitive. It's much more complete. But also if you have no experience with coding and don't and, and find the idea of starting that experience daunting, you can also jump in with this tool that is going to help you with that stage of it. That mm. I, I love the idea of being able to say, you are intelligent, you know what you know, you know what you want to know, mm. that should be enough for you to use a computer yep. to go from there. And I, I think that's just a wonderful place to be. Absolutely. And let's not forget Wolfram Alpha, <laughs> mm -hmm. which have existed for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And how many times in my educational material that I prepare for class, I would just have Wolfram Alpha, you know, just bring up, you know, I want to talk about 
I, you know, now suddenly I can't think of an example, but instead of me, oh, let's say we, we're talking about the development of the understanding of something very simple, the dot product as far sure. as the angle mm -hmm. is concerned. So I want to bring that in. How do I derive that? Oh, I just want to remember the cosine rule from trigonometry quickly. Just put that in your notebook, you know, Wolfram Alpha, there's a beautiful piece written for you. Mm -hmm. you know, just remind everyone quickly of the cosine, you know, rule. And okay, from that, very easy. Now we, we derive an equation for the dot product as far as the angle is concerned. So yeah, many times I just slip in um, uh, Wolfram Alpha, just in my educational material. You know, and, and again, Wolfram Alpha has been with us for quite some time before the large language models of generative mm -hmm. AI that we have. And, and how elegant a solution, you know, has that always been? Mm -hmm. you know, that, that making knowledge com computable in some sense and, and understanding what you're trying to, to, to type into this text box. That's been a brilliant success, hasn't it? Yes. It, it, so yeah, it has. And so we, we've been talking to you about so many different things that uh, you know. I want to make sure that we have a chance to to circle back to anything that uh, might have come up earlier in this conversation that you're excited to talk about. So uh, you know, in in terms of what else uh, do you really want our, our viewers that are with us to uh, you know come taking uh, taking away from this conversation? What are the exciting new resources and things that you would want them to to check out? What are those sorts of, sort of things that we could share? Well, absolutely, as far as the Wolfram language is concerned, are the chat-driven notebooks. I, I, I think that should be your first new, you know, <laughs> chat-driven uh, or chat-enabled, you know, whichever whichever one's going to work for your specific use case, uh, enable those and, and explore those. Yes, you need, an a, you know, you need your API key and, and you, you're going to pay for those tokens. Um, and I think um, as far as those things are concerned, sometimes we perhaps oversensitive with the fact that you actually have to pay for something. No one, you know... Uh, the good things in life unfortunately cost money because they effort they take people's time you know someone worked hard on this and then that's just the way uh, you know what, humanity what, works so yeah, yes what, what, you know you're going to pay for those tokens and so be it um but um you know you for me that's that let's just watch this and and we'll play with it number one and see let's yeah. see where this is going and um and it's so difficult for me, I, I want to say this, so difficult for me to answer the question, because once again, look at that documentation, the front page of the documentation, and look at the breadth of human scientific endeavor that is covered by this language. I, my, my use case on that page is, is, <laughs> is this small, and biology, finance, physics, engineering, you know, you name it, it's there. If, if you haven't, you know, if you're watching this, and from my point of view, if you haven't explored these things, go and go and do it. Uh, yeah, another, uh, you know, quick tip that I'll, I'll give for people if, if you are, are new to, uh, in particular, Wolfram language is that there's a couple of things that are good to understand about the way that it works in general. And then you don't have to know all 6,000, you know, functions to be able to do what you want to do, right? Oh, of course. Uh, it's, it's very much not designed that way. It's designed in such a way that as uh, you were just describing, you know, there's going to be a subset that's relevant for the domain that you care about. There's some things that are sort of very general that are, are nice to know. Uh, and, you know, that's enough to get started. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and once, you know, it's like one of the successes of the design of this language. And also, uh, once you understand a little bit, you can probably guess at what, uh, what, a certain new function is going to do and how it mm -hmm. works you know it is not that there's this divergent approach to um you know how these th how these things are put together i think it's a very easy language to extend you know your use of it without you know having to put in an enormous amount because there's this hodgepodge approach to designing it and the different dialects and the design yeah. of it. you really have to put an effort to learn the language i think it's a, there, there's some some elegance to this language yeah. In as much it's, it's easy in my experience to extend uh, your knowledge of the language but that being said i'm going to fall back on saying that you, you need so little to do so much because it is so powerful uh, I, I can't oversell that in my personal experience and isn't that the goal of the tool to yes. to let you do more with less yeah you, it must not stand in your way must it because uh, Look, I mean, they are com computer scientists, and uh, you know, th mm -hmm. now this particularly is their field, and, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that 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 knowledge exists in, in the Wolfram 
uh, in the company itself, you know, you, people who, whose interest is, is, is the design of the language, but for people uh, who are domain experts outside of computer science, um, and, and you need a tool to solve your problem. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't do much better than the Wolfram language. And, and that's, as I say, I use Python a lot. I use R a lot. And so it's not degrading any of that. Oh, no. Um, but, um, um, and do all of them, you know, please, please go ahead and do all of them. You'll be, a, you know, you, the rewards are there. You'll be richer for it, for doing it. Um, but should the Wolfram language be there? I, I'm hoping just through my, you know, one person's experience, you know, that does not a data <laughs> analysis make. Sure. <laughs> but if, if I just look back and what the language has meant for me and from what I can see, you know, what it has meant to others that whose paths I've crossed and who, who I've started on some journey, um, it's worked beautifully. Uh, it has worked beautifully and I'm continue, I'll continue to use it. Uh, Speaking yeah. of, of, of others that you've sort of helped along this, this path of learning to use in particular uh, Wolfram language to solve problems that they're having. Uh, so as I understand, the, you have uh, new uh, versions of some of the educational materials that, that you've created. Am I correct in understanding that? Yes. Or, so, for instance, all the all the new material for this um, Master Teacher Academy project, um, the the you know onboarding again, or just this, um, sharpening those mathematical skills again, uh, for for our students, those who feel so you know this is this is going to be a resource that exists for our students, and that they can tap into. That is all done. You know, that's all done in the in, in the Wolfram language. Um, there is a version that I am putting out as far as the algebra is concerned using Python. I'm putting that one out as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, so definitely, uh, that is so. Now, our, the formal lecture notes for some of the courses, you know, I joined a department. It's a, it's a newish department, Biostats and Bioinformatics, is a, one of the newest departments in the School of Public Health, you know, having um, evolved out, out of a previous setup. Um, so there are these courses that I am now just teaching that previously were taught by someone else. And, and, and um, you know, there's a large infrastructure of R already existing as far as the educational resources for those are concerned. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to me interacting in person with someone and making it come alive for them, uh, even though I, I uh, will put my hand up and saying I rewrote all of the education material that, that existed for those courses, rewrote all my own. I, I cannot use some, I unfortunately cannot use someone else's uh, notes. Uh, I, I have to remake my own. I, I relate to that. I, I just cannot. And so, yeah, they all redone and, and I did them in R because they existed previously in R. So they're all rewritten and they're all in R. Um, but when I pitch up to in person and I have to make it come alive, um, those notes in class are all, all, all the Wolfram language because I, I can really, I can, I can light that fire. Once again, it's back to being a performance art and what a beautiful um, uh, uh, friend or tool or whatever it is, co-educator in my class, uh, the Wolfram language is my partner in that making it come alive. I, I can't, can't make it come alive in, a, in another language, but someone else might. Uh, my specific use case is I, I, to, I can use, I can make it come alive. With yeah, to make the metaphor very clumsy, perhaps you, you use manipulate to make the figures dance as you're doing the performance art of, of educating. Absolutely. There's nothing, there's just absolutely nothing like it. Jay, speaking of making things alive, thank you for every single word that you said in this interview today. This is, this has all just been enlightening in, in every sense of the word. And I'm, I'm so glad that everyone got to hear it. Oh yeah, um, and sorry for for everything in my 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 little off at tangents. I can speak about this oh, forever no, and ever. <laughs> and and uh, I I really appreciate you listening. Sitting there. <laughs> no, I I mean I think the the audience definitely appreciates not not just hearing about um you know any particular uh, uh topic, right? I mean, of course, we we have a sort of. Uh, a primary focus, but but as we were just discussing, all of the various things that uh, you know students are bringing into their context, you know, as educators, we also bring our own personal experiences and our our sense of community into the the context, and so this is of course relevant to everything that that you're saying. Absolutely, I I, I love a quote uh, from a, a comic book of all things that said, um, "Anyone who thinks one book has all the answers hasn't read enough books," yeah. and I I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of that sort of perspective of saying. 
that even if one tool is capable of doing everything, it doesn't mean that it's always the tool that is the right for everyone to be using. There could be someone who connects with something else. I mean, so much of what you've been talking about today has been about removing artificial barriers and, and oh, allowing I mean, people with different perspective, different experiences to gain the sort of benefits that should be universal to everyone. And I, I love everything about every perspective that you were sharing with us today. No, we live in a wonderful time. And, and as I say, for me personally, I'm, I'm in a wonderful place uh, as far as George Washington University is concerned. And uh, being part of the educational system, being part of a research system, you know, what, what a wonderful time to be to be alive and being, you know, have, have the, the abilities and the tools that we do have today. So my suggestions is to everyone else. Just, it's all around you. Just just reach out and use it. It's um, It's never been as good as it is right now. And from everything I think we can see at the moment, we're just at the precipice of making it even even better. So um, yeah, I can't but be enthusiastic about uh, in, you know these tools in research and 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 in education. Have you ever heard of ameliorism? Tell me about it. Ameliorism is a perspective which is uh, offered as distinct from optimism or pessimism, which is the belief that the world can be improved. And that perhaps on some level, it trends in that direction overall. Mm. And, and I, I've always, I, I don't always have that perspective when I'm looking at a lot of things. It's hard to maintain that perspective, but I hear it in what you're mm. saying to us. And mm. I think as much well, of that is, as possible is good in the world. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I mean, the people must speak out about the positive in the world. You know, it's so easy to talk about the negative and see the negative. And unfortunately, the negative is a reality. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you have to feel bad for, for what is going on in so many places. And in the you world. should not ignore it. You can you cannot ignore it. You cannot do everything yourself. Um, you know, you have to seed um, the work and the responsibility to others. Our, our modern society is divided in as much as you are a specialist in one field, someone else is a specialist in another field. You cannot solve all the problems, even, even though it makes you feel extremely incompetent. And, and uh, you know, you feel at a loss, you, you want to contribute, but you just cannot. Um, and, and perhaps the only way, you know, the only way is to speak out. We each have a voice and, um, and, and concentrate on the positives. I've certainly, you know, be, being at the end of life for many people being, you know, faced with um, you know, the worst of, of what can happen and eventually will happen to each of us, some in a better way than others. Mm -hmm. um, if you do not concentrate on the positive, if we will not, never be driven forward, and maybe perhaps what you said now is so absolutely true because we have moved forward. And perhaps if we look at it critically, yes, we have tended towards the positive side. Otherwise, we would not have been here, you know, where we are today. And uh, there are checks and balances, and they are important as well. Um, um, being conservative in certain circumstances is obviously, uh, you know, is, is, is good. We had yesterday, I had an expert come to my class as far as the, inter, in, um, the review boards are concerned, the, the eth ethics board is concerned to come and speak to my students, you know, and how important that is. And that was a wonderful talk given by uh, Paul Hindebele at, at the university as far as the IRB is concerned. And, uh, you know, so many, so many experts, so many wonderful things, but yeah, so many things to be positive about. Absolutely. And, and this has been a wonderful experience for me to be talk, be able to talk about these positive things. And hopefully it helps one single person. I could say it's helped me. So there's that. Thank you. And I believe you've helped quite a few and then we'll continue to. So uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Jay. Thank you everyone who joined us online thank you everyone who's watching this later as a recorded yes uh interview and it has as as always it's been a, a pleasure to share the time with you thank you very much thank you i really thank you for the opportunity and i'm uh, obviously uh a subscribe to the channel have been watching for so long and looking forward to the to your next one our our listeners should also subscribe uh, to you as well uh because you've got some great content out there I've got a tiny little YouTube channel, yes. <laughs> I yeah, I, uh, I I need to do some more work. There. It's been it's it's been a while. I don't know where how many subscribers I have. Around about twelve thousand. They're about it's tiny little. Channel, I, I have a feeling you're about to get a few more. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much.
no, it's it's wonderful and wonderful what what you're doing. Wonderful what the company is doing. And and but uh, uh, when it comes to research and teaching, I think there's so many people doing wonderful things. And uh, thank you for highlighting some of them. Uh, and e even my tiniest tiniest little contribution. Thank you for that. Yes, thank you so much.